Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. For tonight, we're going to take a look at effective modeling with geometry. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI Technology to make tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. I'm really excited to introduce our two panelists for tonight, Johnny Ashurst and Steve Phelps. Johnny has served as a school district mathematics consultant and as a high school mathematics instructor. He's also served as a mod spar instructor with the Advanced Teacher Capacity Initiative at Ohio University. Johnny, thanks so much for being with us tonight. And Steve, a longtime geometry teacher, currently teaches AP statistics, statistics, and computer science. Steve is a T-Cube national instructor and co-author of the Advanced Quantitative Reasoning, Mathematics, the World Around Us, presenting quantitative literacy, statistics, and modeling as an alternative to the traditional high school senior math courses. Steve, thanks for being with us tonight. Mike, uh, thanks, and uh, thanks for everyone for, to, uh, for attending. I'm certainly excited about it. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free at any time to send any questions to Steve or Johnny using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. I know we're also going to be using the chat window tonight to send messages back and forth. As a reminder, the session is being recorded, and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues tonight, but in the event that you do, try selecting communicate from the WebEx menu and choose audio broadcast. If that doesn't clear things up, find your name in the participant window and locate an icon that looks like a telephone. By clicking the icon, you'll receive call in information that will let you switch from the audio broadcast to using a phone. At this point, Johnny is going to discuss our agenda. Johnny, you there? Uh, I am. Uh are we, can we pull up that screen? Yep, looks like we should be on the agenda slide right now. Okay. Uh, Steve or Mike, you can do that. I am not seeing the screen right now. Steve, would you mind walking us through the agenda? I can do this. So our agenda tonight, uh, we, we've already done the welcome and introductions. Um, we have three activities, time setting. We have the uh, triangle activity, rotating a triangle activity, and then cutting a circle. And again, we probably will not do that. And depending on how um, active you are in the chat window, we may not even uh, be rotating a triangle, but we'll see. Um, at the end, Mike will share some online resources, and will also share how you can win registration for two to the 2018 Cube International Conference. Um, if you attend this webinar for the chance to win the complimentary registration for two to the 2018 T Cube International Conference, March 2nd, 3rd, and 4th in San Antonio, Texas, the Riverwalk. Steve, thanks so much. And also, Steve, would you mind uh, talking through a few of our expected outcomes for tonight? I will, Mike. Expected outcomes. If things go according to plan, we will all be using our TI Inspire technology to construct, analyze, and transform interactive geometric objects. Actually, you guys will probably be watching me do this. It's okay. Our second expected outcome, we're going to explore the 3D graphing capability um, that's in the Inspire to create geometric models and think critically about them. 
Again, I'll be manipulating. Hopefully, you'll be thinking critically about them. And then we'll show you ways that um, we feel that fiber technology and 3D graphing can be used to enhance students' spatial reasoning skills by developing the importance of clarifying questions. Steve, thanks so much. I'm getting a little bit of uh, feedback from you. Uh, can you just make sure that you don't have uh, like any speakers turned up? Um, but I'm giving you control right now, and you should be good to go. I think we uh, inadvertently lost Johnny, so we're going to work on getting him back. Uh, but Steve, it is all yours. All right, everyone, thanks. Let me go ahead and share my screen, and then so we can see what's happening. And when uh, Johnny gets back, Um, he can join us. So, um, again, I'm, I'm Steve Phelps, and you can find me on Twitter at uh, G-I-O-H-I-O. And Johnny can be found on Twitter at Kilted Cyclist. And, again, this, this uh, presentation is about effective modeling with geometry. So something Johnny and I have talked about um, I know in the Common Core State Standards, uh, there's not much that seems to be done with three-dimensional geometry. And I, I think that's kind of a shame because I think most of our students, um, well, they live in a three-dimensional three world, and but we never really give them a chance to kind of study that world actively. So in the, in the Common Core State Standards, um, again, again, in this one, uh, use geometric shapes, their measures, and their properties to describe objects. We'll kind of do this informally tonight and see if we can kind of um, think things through about some three-dimensional geometry items. Um, some of the other content uh, standards uh, apply concepts of, of densities based on areas and volumes. Uh, we won't necessarily work with density, but we'll certainly work with uh, volumes and areas and trying to uh, um, explore some relationships between the volumes and areas of uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional objects. And apply geometric methods to solve design problems. Though um, we're not really solving design problems, we are um, taking two-dimensional objects and constructing three-dimensional objects out of them. So I would consider that a design problem. The mathematical practices that we feel that um, but by doing something like this with your students, and at least tonight, um, I think we'll, all, uh, we'll, we'll be asking all of you to reason abstractly and quantitatively. Um, we'll we'll um, also ask e each other to construct uh, arguments and maybe to, crit to critique the reasoning of others. And um, of course, we're going to be modeling with mathematics. We'll actually be modeling more with geometry, but a lot of the things behind the scene uh, require mathematics to, uh, to make those things work. So, so this is a this is kind of our direction for tonight. A couple of things about the chat window. So um, I, I know we there are two kinds of windows where you can um, where you can put some questions, and we're going to prefer to use the chat window tonight. And here are a couple of chat window protocols. So from time to time, we will ask you to participate in our chat. And what we'd like you to do is um, when we pose a question is we'd like you to type your answers into the chat window, but do not press enter or send the message right away. By doing this, this gives everyone a chance to think and type. And instead of kind of, as it, kind of being a race of seeing who can get to the chat first, just give everyone a chance to think. And then when, um, only when Johnny or I give the word, should you enter, or send your chat response. And that word for tonight will be flamingo. So again, the chat protocols, when we ask you to participate in the chat, type your answer in, but do not press enter to send the message. And when we say flamingo, then you can send the message. And without further ado, Here's our first, our first thing is we're going to talk about is the folding up a triangle into a tetrahedron. So let's talk about this for a second. 
So Arga, I hate when that scrolls down to the wrong spot. So here's your first question. So I've got this triangle over here on the left-hand side of my screen. Gosh, I hope you can see it. Since I can't see your computer screen, so I've got A seems to move freely and C seems to move freely and so does B. So um, what kind of information would you like to know about the triangle? Type it into the chat window, but don't send it yet until, of course, I say the word. And again, guys, we are using the chat window. We are using the chat window. I'm going to jump in, uh, Steve, for one second and add to your uh, chat window protocol. Uh, whenever you're, everyone's typing their responses now, right above your response, it, there's a send to feature. And the default is probably all attendees. And it would be great if you could change that to all participants. And that way, uh, Steve, Johnny, and I can see everyone's responses. So again, uh, you're not going to hit enter yet, but uh, make sure you send your responses to all participants tonight. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Mike, for clarifying that. So make sure it's set to all participants. And when you are ready, Flamingo. <laughs> There's no way I can read all this stuff. Yes. Yes. Is it a key? Oh, awesome. Awesome. Great questions. Length of the two sides. Are the two sides triangle equal? Fantastic. Fantastic. Man, those, all those questions just kind of popped on there like popcorn. Goodness gracious. So here's another question. Here's another question I want you to think about. Oh, I got to move the chat window a little bit. So it, would it be possible if I took this triangle as it's drawn right here, as this triangle is drawn that you see in the image on the left, could this triangle be folded into a tetrahedron by folding up the vertices, like taking A and B and C and kind of folding them together and creasing the sides in the appropriate places? So could this triangle be folded up into a tetrahedron? And go ahead and type your answers into the chat, but don't press enter. I'll give you a second or two. All right, kids. Flamingo. So when Johnny and I were practicing practicing for this webinar, this is what I what I um I was afraid would happen. There'd be a lot of yes or no answers and, and not much uh, elaboration. But um, so let's see, I've got some yeses and nos, of course. So they not certain. I'm not sure. Does it matter if triangles? Ooh, does it matter if it's equilateral or isosceles? Possibly. It's got some yeses, got not certain. That is awesome, guys. That is awesome. That is awesome. So. Let me let me have you guys elaborate on that a bit. And so your next question is, how did you make your decision on that last question? Many of you guys answered yes or no, or maybe or possibly. So how did you make that decision? What did you do? What were you thinking in your head? So take a, take a couple of seconds and maybe type an answer type an answer into the chat, but don't don't send it yet. See, I agree with that, Ray. It did ask for, well, it, it could have been asked with a yes or no question. I didn't like that originally. So, guys, Flamingo. Oh, man. I hope Johnny comes back. There are so many questions that pop out of there. So many questions. Hmm. Oh. Steve, Steve, just to let you know, Johnny is back, uh, and I think Johnny knows this, but he is currently muted in WebEx, but he's back. He's back. Thanks, Mike. 
face. <laughs> got it. <laughs> and net it. So, okay, I got it. So only equilaterals can. Ooh, I like these. I like these questions. So these are the thoughts that are going on in your head. So this is kind of like the prior knowledge that students would bring to your class. And so you guys are kind of giving me your prior knowledge. Prior Equilaterals for sure. You can crease and fold the corners. Not equilateral, I don't think they'll meet up at a point. Oh man, this is awesome. Great, great questions. Great, great, great answers to the questions. My gosh. So here's one more question to answer before we go on. And most, most of you guys have answered it. Yes, I know it's a yes or no question, Ray. I know that. But um, is it possible, don't send it yet, but can every triangle be folded up into a tetrahedron this way? And flamingo. I should have put this out as a poll is what I should have done. That would have been awesome to have a poll of this. So it seems to be a lot of no's and then there seems to be a lot of yeses. And uh, yeah, so I'm just looking for a tetrahedron, just one that's not necessarily regular. And then let's see, uh, ooh, only for an equilateral triangle. Love this, love this. Not to make a regular tetrahedron, I got it, I got it. Uh-oh, now someone's, someone's starting to think yes. Nice, 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 nice. Guys, I appreciate, I appreciate your participation in the chat window. I really do appreciate this. Let's move on, let's move on. I don't think there's any more questions. There are no more questions. So here is my next slide. Uh-oh, let me hide those puppies. And so, um, ready? I'm just gonna drag this little triangle on the left around. With me? See, I'm dragging it around. And notice on the right-hand side, it seems to be another copy of the triangle with another weird little triangle kind of on the inside that seems to be moving around. So as I drag this puppy around, here's your first question I want you to think of. And it's at the bottom down here. What questions are like, are just burning right now in your minds? What questions are you thinking of? Like, oh man, what is going on in this picture? What is going on? And maybe your question might be, uh, something directed towards me like, gee, Steve, I wonder if you would do this. All right. So what questions are you thinking about? What question would you like to ask? What questions could you ask? And flamingo. Can we see what happens when we make the triangle uh, obtuse or right? Got it, okay, okay, okay. Linda, that's a great question right there. Why is the area important? Does the area of the triangle affect the ability of the fold? That is, that, that's a great question, man. That's a great question. Okay, so okay. the answer. Okay, Nancy, I got it. Good, good, good. So the image on the left-hand side is, of course, a two-dimensional geometry. It's a graphing page where I've hidden the axes. And the image on the right is a, um, is a 3D view. And so let me, let me, reveal, let me reveal the 3D view by uh, what I'm doing is on my keyboard, I actually pressed Z on my keyboard. I'm looking straight down the Z axis. If I, click, if I press O on my keyboard, oh, I gotta click over here first. If I click O, that, um, kind of puts it in a standard orientation. And let me press A and it will rotate that, um, that 3D graphing view around. So now as I, drag, um, as I drag this point A on the left, as I drag that around, it doesn't like it when I'm 
when I'm dragging or when I'm rotating. So as I drag point A, I have this tetrahedron on the right-hand side. So here's some questions for you. So tetrahedron, first question. Here's an easy one. This will be an easy one. What is the surface area of this tetrahedron? Again, type in your answer. Hello, Steve. Hi, John. <laughs> I decided to come back. Okay, guys. Flamingo. Great questions. Those are great answers to the question. So I think that um, so there so there might be some misconceptions or misunderstanding this image on the right hand side. So this image on the right hand side, if I look down the z axis, um, this kind of wireframe triangle around the outside is the same area as the triangle on the left. And so I've folded up those vertices. So it seems reasonable to suggest, it seems reasonable to think that the uh, surface area of the tetrahedron will have the same area as the surface area or as the area of my triangle. So I can see where folks, some folks might have might have answered a um, 304, thinking that if that would be true if each of the small sides was 76.1 but all of the four sides together add up to a, add up to 76.1. So great question. So here, here's the, um, here's, here's the next question. And Johnny, if there's something that you would like to uh, throw out there, throw out there, but here's my next question. And so notice at the top of the screen on the left, I have revealed the volume to you. So the volume of the, of the tetrahedron um, for this particular area is 33.3 .3 units cubed. And what questions would you like to ask about the volume? And so take a take a couple of seconds and think of some questions in your in your head. And I'm anticipating most of these would be the types of questions that you would probably end up asking in a calculus class. And Flamingo. <laughs> Forgot the volume. <laughs> Forgot the volume of the volume. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, one point, Steve, with so many questions, which reminds me of what happens uh, when you're when you are dealing with or conducting a class in a modeling format. You expect questions to be very diverse, I think. I've got a side question with this, Steve. Yeah. What would be the largest volume? Oh. Does anybody have an answer for the largest volume? Yeah. As, as the triangle, as the tetrahedron triangle, um, with that triangle. That's a free range question. If you have a, a thought on that. Uh, flamingo on that. Johnny, I know there's some um, responses in the chat window about how to do this. Right. Um, what buttons to press and things like that. And um, 
I know I will be doing a session at T cubed on um, solids of revolutions and building, at least building kind of surfaces like this at T cubed. So we'll certainly do more than that. I know that Mike will send out a, a copy of this file um, at the conclusion of this uh, webinar. And so you can always go into the, uh, go into the graphing uh, areas and uh, reveal the equations that are used to create each of the sides. But I think the, uh, yeah, certainly the intent was not to um, walk everyone through the button pushing for these, because that would be way hard to do. So, I've, all right, Steve, uh, back to what you were doing. Um, will you do me a small favor before you move on? Will you do something to change the volume from 33.3? Cool. Yes. So let, let's gather some data. Let's gather some data. So on the next page, I have a um, I have three columns. I have and I need to set these columns up so that I can do some automatic data capturing. So I'm going to change the zero to one. And um, so so what I'm interested in is I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to return back to the previous page. I'd, I'd like to populate this spreadsheet with um, and with the triangle area, with the volume of the tetrahedron, and with the triangle perimeter. And I'd like to maybe explore um, what those graphs might look like. So I'm just going to take point A and drag point A a little bit, and then I'm going to drag point B a little bit and then drag point C a little bit, not that I have to do those things. Uh, Steve, uh, while you're doing this, uh, I did notice something in the chat worth mentioning. Someone said, my students do not have calculators during class. Uh, I think that uh, any teacher could model what you're doing and have students continue to be interactive as uh, participants are here. So sometimes uh, if you don't have the software or the handhelds, a one computer system with effective questioning uh, can be still be powerful. So I've generated, thanks Johnny. I've generated a, a boatload of data points. Well, if 142 is a boatload. And so um, what I'm interested in is think about this for a little bit and um, what would the graph of volume, if volume on the y, is on the y-axis versus area on the x-axis, what would that graph look like? So um, think about that for a second. Type your answer into the chat, and then um, when we give the word, you can uh, enter your answer, and the word is Flamingo. I do see one of the responses is IDK, but I don't know what IDK means. Nicely done. So let me put in um, triangle area and volume. How did that happen? This is the graph of the triangle area versus the volume. Appears to be linear. So think about this for a moment. Think about this. Put your uh, put your teacher hats on. And why? Why does this graph need to be linear? And then don't don't press send yet, please. Don't press send yet. Let folks type in an answer so they can think about that, and then we will. We will give you the word, and the word is flamingo. So 
someone asked if I could go back to the uh, data. So there I went back to the data. Yeah, so I think uh, some folks are, are thinking about this. I, I think originally I wonder if kids would say it would be some sort of a, a cubic function because they're so used to seeing, you know, uh, the side of something or the radius of something and the volume is related by cubing that in some way. So I wonder if students would see this problem and think it would be some sort of a cubic function when actually uh, we're giving you the area. And so area and volume are related uh, linearly. So nice, nice, nice. So what do you guys think? Um, here's the next question then. Think about this. Um, if, we, if we graphed perimeter instead of the uh, area, what would the graph look like? So again, please recall the chat protocols. Type your answer in, but don't press send yet. And while you are doing that, I'm going to go get a few more points to fill in. And then we'll go back and... So perimeter on the x-axis, perimeter on the x-axis, volume on the y. Flamingo, different, <laughs> nicely done, nicely done. Ooh, great questions. So let's change it and see. I don't know if this is going to work or not. We'll find out. It, it will either work or it won't work. What? What? That is strange. Why would the graph look like that? Huh. Interesting. Surprised? Is my data collection corrupted in some way? Or why might this... Uh, Kind of seems like the points are filling in more of a region instead of a nice, neat, straight line. So why why do you think that's why do you think this is a I think this is this way. There's a technology question there, Steve. Uh, if there is any rounding. Mm -hmm. Would you say a fair answer is in the spreadsheet there's rounding, but not in the, uh, but not in the graph. And on this scale, would how much difference would that make? It's, it's a good discussion on the technology of it. So I think something to think about is that um, volume graphed against area is linear, but triangles with different perimeters, are, or there could be many triangles for a given perimeter that have different areas. So here's a triangle with a perimeter of 30, and there may actually be a couple of different areas that are made by a triangle to perimeter of 30. So I, I'm not sure, it seems kind of reasonable that it would be a kind of a blob like this, but uh, it's kind of hard to explain it any other way. So here, let's, let's move on to the next, uh, my next question. Now I teach statistics. You'd think I teach geometry, but I teach statistics. So I have a, a, a statistics question for you to think about. And so, and it goes like this. And so maybe maybe if you have a um, a, a pencil and a, a piece of paper, 
And if you just kind of close your eyes and put down three random points, how likely would it be for those random points to form a triangle that could be folded up into a tetrahedron? So if I just put three points down randomly on a piece of paper and connected those with segments, how likely would it be for those three points to form a triangle? Let's remember our chat protocols. And flamingo, <laughs> unlikely. Yeah, Karen, that's exactly. So really it's, a, it's asking the question, would the three points form an acute triangle? It is possible. Is it plausible? It is possible, but is it plausible? In order to be folded up into a tetrahedron, it does need to be an acute triangle. In other words, if the triangle is obtuse, it won't be able to be folded up into a tetrahedron. So here is a um, here is the spreadsheet I used, and again. What I did is um, my first two columns, X, A, and Y, A, are generating randomly one point. And so I used the sequence command to generate 100 random values between, um, between zero and one. And I'm assuming that my uh, piece of paper was the unit square. So I picked three random points within the unit square. And so I've got X, A, Y, A, X, B, Y, B, X, C, and Y, C. And then I computed three dot products because I wanted to check if each of the angles was, a, was acute or not. And so the dot product of uh, the two vectors that form each angle would let me know that. If the dot product is negative, I know that that angle is obtuse. If the dot product is positive, I know that angle is acute. And if it's zero, I know it's a right angle. So in this first row, I have a negative number. So I know that this combination of points can, would not be folded up into a triangle because this angle is obtuse. And so right now, um, there are 30, or I'm sorry, there are 100 um, simulated random triangles. And what I have done is I have captured the number of triangles. There are 100 sim simulated here. And I capture how many of them um, can form up into a tetrahedron. And right now I have 100 of those. And so I could easily, by pressing Control R and holding it down, I could easily simulate some more until I get to 200. And so I have simulated 200 uh, random triangles and this 20 is what my most recent or like the last triangle was. And so I now have 200 simulated triangles. And if I go to the dot plot, that's the dot plot. So it seems that out of, uh, out of 100, seems reasonable to think somewhere about 25, maybe to 30 of them would form, would form tetrahedrons. So oh, perfect, perfect. Any questions so far, kids? If you have any questions, you wanna put them in the chat and I'll give you the flamingo.
Myra, I'm not sure what you mean about a control built in to make sure that the sum of two uh, of two sides is larger than the third. You could you could probably make it that way. Um, I think, uh, Celia, I think this first problem um, would certainly be appropriate for an honors class. The next problem is appropriate for any class because I've, I've done I've done this next problem with um, all of my geometry classes. Yeah, now this is not for seventh or eighth graders, but I think certainly um, I think certainly any high school geometry class could at least begin to approach the tetrahedron problem and certainly this, certainly this next problem. Thanks for the questions, guys. Thanks for the questions. So here's our next problem. Rotating a right triangle, and this right triangle has a fixed area, and I want to rotate this triangle around one of its legs. So for example, I have this tri right triangle on the left-hand side that has a fixed area of 25. And you notice on the right-hand side, this is my uh, 3D view again. And if I set that to rotating, that triangle in the 3D view is the same triangle that I see on the left-hand side. Let me stop the rotation. So as I drag this up or down, that triangle on the right-hand side. And what I would like to do is I'd like to rotate that triangle on the right side. I would like to rotate this around that horizontal line on the left side, which is the z-axis on the right side. And so it forms this cone. And so my first question for the chat window is this. And again, remember the chat protocols, but what questions would you like to ask about this situation? So I'll go back to the previous slide. And what questions would you like to ask about this situation of rotating a triangle around one of its sides? And... Flamingo. I like those questions, Steve, that say what happens when. I know, I was looking at those too. What happens when, what happens when? What is? That's a nice calculus question, Barry. Nice questions, nice questions. So here's, I've got another one, I've got another one, let's see. Let me slide this off to the side. And um, here is, uh, what will the graph of the volume on the y-axis versus height on the x-axis look like? So let me go back to this picture. Remember it is uh, height would be on the y, or would be on the uh, x-axis and the volume of the cone would be on the y-axis. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go um, set my capture in the spreadsheet so it does this automatically. And then I will go back and collect some data. And if you would like to let your answers go now with the magic word flamingo. So what the graph, what do you think the graph will look like? Inverse proportion. Ooh, crap. Ooh, nice. Nice. Good, good questions. Good questions. Good questions. 
Oh, what is the question? So what will the graph of this, um, if we graphed volume on the y-axis and the height of this triangle on the x-axis, what would it look like? Keeping in mind that the area of the triangle is being held constant. And so here is what our graph looks like now. Let me move this chat window out of the way so you can see this. So height is on the x-axis and volume is on the y-axis. Is there anything that um, sticks out about this graph? Anything that you wonder about? Anything you, that you find out of the ordinary? If you want to type that in the chat window here in the next couple of seconds, and I will give you the word shortly. So is there anything that's kind of weird or odd about this graph? And Mike, if you're listening, by my clock, I have about six minutes left, and then I'll turn it back over to you. And Flamingo, kids. <laughs> C14 Half-Life, nicely done. Nicely done, Carol, nicely done. You know, when I first graphed it, it was unexpected for me too, Nancy. This was unexpected. So let's answer my next question. Here's the next question for you before I, before I change the graph. And this might be the last thing that I can um, actually do tonight. But um, what would the graph of volume versus radius look like? So if I, if I placed radius on the x-axis and left volume on the y-axis, what do you think that graph would look like? Keeping in mind that the area of the triangle is being kept fixed. And flamingo. So the, the question um, the question is, what will the graph of volume versus radius look like? It might. Let's go look at the graph. Let me change our graph for us. And I'll put radius in there. And it does look linear. So here's what I like to do, folks. I need to leave Mike some time at the end so he can do his housekeeping items. And so my stopwatch that I started when I started the presentation um, is three minutes left. So you will be getting a copy of this file without all the questions, though, embedded. You'll just be getting a, a blank file. So let me, um, let me show you a couple of other things that are in this file that you can play with. And then um, um, I will probably by then be out of time and I will turn this back over to Mike. But the next problem is um, if you rotated a rectangle with a constant area. So similar to what we did with triangles. And then you could explore the volume this way to help your students visualize. And so again, my, I always wondered, should this come first or maybe uh, should the triangle come first? But I think certainly a cylinder is easier to work with. And this is the problem I started with with my college prep geometry kids, not my honors geometry kids.
but even my college prep geometry kids did the triangle problem. Um, there is a question about a, another triangle with a constant area of 25, and uh, my triangle is on the left, and there is the uh, double cone on the right. And if I unwrap that double cone, you can see what that looks like. And the um, the last two is, is this is one that's a, a common one that you'll see if I have a circular region and I take a part of the circle out and I can shape that into the lateral sides of a cone. And then how is the volume or surface area of this cone related to the size of the angle removed or the size of the angle that is left? And an interesting question um, from a colleague on Twitter is if you created a cone from the part that you cut out, how would the two volumes be related? And then the last one is a bonus one. So this is a triangle that's not on an axis. And if I set this rotating on the uh, right-hand side, you can kind of uh, observe uh, how this looks. Uh, this would be um, probably somewhat slow on your handheld, but it will work. Uh, it'll work well on the calculator software. But again, Mike will be uh, Mike will be getting these to you in some way. And uh, I've got about 19 seconds left. So if there's a, any anything good for the uh, anything for the good of the order, I will uh, flamingo this right now, and I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, Steve. Yes. How about one other thing? If someone wants to uh, send you a question, uh, do you have a – is Twitter or email, which is better? Um, if, you, if you hook me up on Twitter, G-I-O-H-I-O, -I -O, and just direct message me, I can get that stuff to you or answer any questions that way or make a screencast for you and send that out. So anything you'd like, let me know. And, again, attend my, attend my session at T-Cubed where I'll be doing solids of revolutions and solids that are formed by cross-sections. So, yeah, see me at TQ. Thanks so much, right. Steve and Johnny. So, Steve, if you could just uh, give me control back. Oh, yeah. If I just drag the ball to you. That's it. I'm sorry. I thought you could do that. It's, it's all good. Thanks, man. Yes, thank you. So I know earlier um, there was a, a couple people that mentioned that they were possibly looking for just some of the uh, generic, uh, if you will, capabilities of the calculator as opposed to uh, some of the stuff that was shared tonight. So I wanted to go through and, and at least mention where you can find some of those uh, resources. On our website, if you move under the Professional Development tab and go down to Webinars and Tutorials, On the right-hand side are technology tutorials, and you can choose, for instance, TI Inspire, and then the TI Inspire and TI Inspire Cast Technology. And there are these atomic learning tutorials, which are really great, uh, whether you're just starting out with TI Inspire or you, you've been a TI Inspire user for a long time and maybe forgotten some of the capabilities. Uh, but as you can notice, these, these videos are all really short, usually a few minutes in length. Everything's free, so you can rewatch the video uh, at your leisure. So please feel free to check out the Atomic Learning Tutorials on our website. Under that same tab, the Webinars and Tutorials, feel free to look at the left-hand tab, the Live Webinars. You can see that our webinars for the, the fall are coming to an end soon. We have two more webinars coming up uh, next few weeks. Uh, one is dealing with life-saving STEM projects, and the second is dealing with uh, some statistics, uh, somewhat specific to AP statistics, but really great uh, if you're just a, a fan of statistics in general. Again, those webinars are free, and please feel free to register for any of the webinars that you feel may be 
beneficial. So Steve did a great job uh, sort of plugging the T-Cubed International Conference. We're really excited. I just got an email, uh, I believe today, that this year's keynote speaker is going to be John Urschel. Uh, for those of you that don't know uh, of John Urschel, a uh, former uh, NFL uh, football player turned uh, MIT um, doctoral student uh, and has some really exciting things to share. So um, if, uh, if you want to come and see Steve Phelps and Johnny Ashurst and myself and a, a lot of other people, uh, as well as John Urschel, please come to the T-Cubed International Conference, again, coming to San Antonio in early March. We mentioned that uh, One Lucky Winner tonight is going to receive a conference registration for that T-Cubed International Conference, and tonight's lucky winner is Tuba Dundar. So Tuba, congratulations. We hope to see you uh, at the T-Cubed International Conference along with everyone else. So to receive a certificate for tonight, go ahead and click that link in the chat window. Also, this is a link for the documents that were used tonight by Johnny and Steve, um, especially uh, some of the things that Johnny and Steve shared tonight. I know it's going to be uh, pretty nice to have uh, some of the work that Johnny and Steve had done already in the background so it doesn't have to be recreated, and you can let your students explore. If you happen to miss those two links or they're not working for you, feel free just to wait a couple of days in your email. You'll automatically get uh, a link to the recording, a link to the certificate, as well as a link for the documents. And if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. Thanks so much, Johnny and Steve, for everything you shared tonight. Um, I really liked the uh, pause in the chat window and the flamingo. Uh, I thought that was great. It really gave gave everyone time to think. I thought we saw some really unique and creative answers because of that. So again, thanks for everything you shared tonight. I really appreciate it. Again, thanks again, everyone, for attending. We hope to see you back online. Real soon, have a great night.